Thank you, Larry. That was a very uh, kind introduction. <laughs> you know, I was watching a movie on the plane a couple, couple of weeks ago. I don't know if you've seen Martian Child. No? One of the, the lines that John Cusick is saying to this little kid is about baseball. He says, baseball is a great sport because, you know, you can just hit three out of ten times and still be good. And if you hit just a little bit more, you'll be great. And I hope this is not one of those three times. But, um, you know, I, I resonate with what Bob was saying. It's God's grace that brings us to where we are and allows us to serve him in, for this time. And we don't know the future, but we know one thing, and we know that God is good and faithful. So I hope that today I can share with you some things that will um, inform you, inspire you, and help us all together as Christian leaders and people involved in the Bible translation movement to, to really impact uh, the communities that God has called us to serve. Amen. All right, I'm going to start with a question, and I know at least one person who will know the answer, because, well, you'll see. How many of you guys know who William Walker was? Any hands? No one? All right. William Walker was an American, born in Tennessee in 1824, and he has the... Uh, honor distinction of being known as a filibuster. You know what a filibuster is? Well, these were guys who were bent on conquest, and they were, part of this was America's idea of manifest destiny. So William Walker was hired by a group of rebels, Nicaraguan rebels, and he brought mercenaries with him, and he invaded Nicaragua and conquered it, and eventually became president of Nicaragua. And his plan was to annex Nicaragua and most of Central America to the United States. Did you know this? And did you know that the U.S. government uh, recognized his regime as legitimate? Do you know why? Well, before the, the Panama Canal was completed, there was um, a plan to, to, to have a canal through Nicaragua because of the big lake right in the middle of Nicaragua. And if some of you are wondering, where in the world is Nicaragua? And I'm glad you're here. Because what happens is, you know, often in, in our experience working in Latin America, um, being so close to the United States and so influenced by its history and its economy and its commerce, we we're just astounded at the, at the level of, of the lack of knowledge of what Latin America is like on the part of most Americans of all ethnic backgrounds. I'm not picking on any one particular person. And so, you know, William Walker eventually uh, fell into disgrace, and most Americans don't remember him. But in, in Costa Rica, every April 11, we celebrate the day when he was defeated by the troops of, uh, of the Central American countries. And we celebrate the national hero, Juan Santa Maria, who was instrumental in, in defeating Walker at the Battle of Rivas. See, none of you know that. I d honestly, I didn't know until I moved to Costa Rica, where they celebrate this greatly. And, you know, even as this past year in, in, in Costa Rica and in Central America, we've been discussing the, the free trade agreement. You know about this too, right? CAFTA, Central America Free Trade Agreement. William Walker and Juan Santa Maria come up all the time in the rhetoric for those who oppose the free trade agreements. But also, that helps us to understand a little bit of the dynamic of the relationship between North America and Latin America. In fact, I just found out that the term Latin America, well, we didn't invent it. You know who invented it? Napoleon. As he made his designs to conquer what was then Spanish and Portuguese-speaking America. And he took over Mexico and appointed his brother as viceroy of his empire and then set out to conquer the rest of Latin America. So our past and much of, of our history is molded by the uh, overtures of of world powers that want to annex or take advantage of or use Latin America as a buffer. And I won't go into all the recent history with the Soviet Union and other things. And so whether it's true or not, there's a, a real sense in Latin America and in the church that we need to become our own. We need to be who we are as Latin Americans without influence from other parts of the world, especially in this time in, in history from the United States. Now, uh, why am I sharing that with you? Well, I want you to get, a, you know, get an idea with the context that we're working out of. And 
Um, I was sharing this with uh, the executive from another large mission in, who wants to work in Latin America and is just absolutely frustrated by what he perceives uh, the big chip on people's shoulder about Americans. Um, I happen to agree with him on some things, but uh, I think that understanding the context and the times is going to make a difference in how we relate to our brothers and sisters in Latin America and how we understand even the Latin American um, diaspora living in North America over 40 million Hispanics or Latins living in, in, the, in, Latin America, in, in the U.S. and Canada. So um, this is William Walker. He's one of our friends, and we, can, we have lots of his stories like that. If you're interested in knowing more about some of um, secular forces that, that have uh, transformed Latin America and understand it from an entertaining point of view, I recommend some of the books by Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Some of you have heard him. He won the Nobel Peace Prize for the, the novel 100 Years of Solitude. I've read that book seven times. I recommend it. It's not what you expect, but I think it will give you a glimpse of the, the Latin American mentality as he sees it as a, as a fiction writer. Some little tidbits about Latin America. And again, you know, I'm, I'm totally generalizing here. We're talking about over 20 countries and many different cultures and ethnic backgrounds. But, um, as Latin Americans, our family and community are the center of our lives. That's what defines who we are. And as people like me and others uh, come to the Lord, that Christ pervades every sphere of that, but they continue to be important forces that shape our lives. We are very diverse. There is no United States of Latin America. And that's one of the things that I have seen organizations that want to work in Latin America that just make these generalized assumptions, or they're led by people who maybe spend their lives in Bolivia or in Guatemala, and that colors their entire um, interpretation of Latin America, and they get very surprised when they go to other countries. So there is over 20 Spanish-speaking countries, and, um, and in Brazil, which is half the population in Latin America, and uh, we're very influenced by the Spanish and the Portuguese culture, but not exclusively. Uh, we are not a, being a Latin American is not a racial or ethnic uh, categorization is more of a geographical, regional one. And because we have European and indigenous roots, for some, the roots are Arabic or Middle Eastern or Asian or a combination of any of these. So that's Latin America. We value our history and our national languages, Spanish and Portuguese, are very important, although there are hundreds of indigenous languages that are also spoken in, in, in many of our countries. Something you probably already know, many of us don't show up on time, but we are very generous with our time. And you will see that over and over again. And yes, our, most of us love our football, or soccer, sorry. <laughs> um, but you know, there are over 40, nearly 40 million Latinos living in the United States alone. It's almost half a billion Latin Americans living in the, in the, in the hemisphere. Another interesting thing that I found out, um, is I, ma I married a girl from Wisconsin, and she told me there's two Americas, and I grew up being told there's only one America, you know, one continent, and then I found out that there's two actually, North and South America, and there's still a matter of debate in our house. But if you come across a Latin America, be sensitive about that when you say that you're American, he'll say, I am too. Right? Okay. <laughs> Maybe some of you have already encountered that, and I'm not assuming that I'm talking to a group that's totally ignorant. I know that you guys know a lot of these things. <laughs> I mean, about Latin America. So the reality of, of, of the church in, in our context is that our countries, the majority are Catholic and have been Catholic for a number of, well, two, three hundred years. But, um, but that's changing. The gospel, as we know it, from evangelical missionaries, was brought in, in early, what century is this? Early 19th century, uh, mostly by Presbyterian and Baptist missionaries, then later by um, Central America mission missionaries and others like that. Um, I was just reading this. It was really interesting. Uh, Pedro Moreno, in, in 1997, said at the beginning of, of the 1980s, there are about 18.6 million evangelicals in Latin America. Now, and he's writing in 97, there are close to 60 million with 8,000 Latin American converts to evangelicalism every day. 
according to the Latin American Catholic Bishops Conference, evangelical, evangelicals make up 7 to 35 percent of the population in Latin American countries, becoming in, in Guatemala, Brazil, and Nicaragua more numerous than practicing Catholics. But the growth that has taken place in the last 20 years has taken place among Pentecostals. They are the fastest growing denomination in the world. Recent statistics show that Pentecostals account for two out of every three evangelicals in Latin America. And according to one estimate, nearly 40% of the world's Pentecostals live in Latin America. And these, these statistics have changed now. There's over 80 million evangelicals, about half of which are in Brazil. In fact, you know, the Pope was recently in Brazil in, I think, November, two weeks after I was in Sao Paulo. And, you know, out of all the issues that the Catholic Church is facing around the world, and especially in Latin America, um, all sorts of things, the one thing that he said was the number one priority was to, what? Uh, as he put it very delicately, delicately, to fight against the growth of evangelical sects. <laughs> I didn't know I was part of a sect, but anyway, that's how they define it. And so, that's another thing that you have to understand, and you may come from a very different context when it comes to uh, evangelical Catholic relationships. But in Latin America, it's still a very difficult, strained relationship. And in many circles where I work, if they knew that we work so closely with Catholics, I probably would not be welcome. And I don't, so I'm not saying that I agree with that, but I'm saying that's the reality, and we have to be sensitive to that. Just this week, uh, it was all over YouTube, of course, you know, news now come out of YouTube first, that towns in southern Mexico that are expelling all the evangelical families and passing laws that, that make it against the law to practice any other customs other than what our Catholic forefathers, forefathers gave to us. And people are kicked out of their homes that have been, they've been there for generations and being um, killed in some cases and persecuted. Same thing is in Colombia where pastors are the favorite target of of the narco traffickers and, and guerrillas. So this is the context in which the church is growing. Uh, among the phenomenal growth of the church in places like Guatemala and Brazil, there's also a lot of persecution still going on. Um, and I will share some of, some of our, my concerns in terms of that, that growth. But let me just review a little bit more about you know some of our, our context in the 70s and 80s most of our countries were in some kind of revolution or civil war or some kind of military government and I don't want to go into all the details as, as to why that happened but that also greatly impacted the work of Bible translation that our organizations were taking were doing it in in, in those countries in many cases it meant that our, our personnel and our branches were expelled from the countries uh, because of governments or because they were either identified with the CIA or identified with the guerrillas, the, the communist guerrillas, for wanting to work with the Indians and wanting to help the Indians. And so in places like, like Mexico and Brazil and, and other branches, uh, there was great difficulty to carry out the work. Uh, anthropologists started writing against the work that we were doing in Bible translation. But that, that, w that had an impact in what's going on today even with, with the work that we're doing because uh, the idea started to actually hit us that one day we may not be there as an organization. And what have we done to empower local communities and local churches, local organizations to really engage by, in Bible translation if we had to leave? So as well as in other, in other parts of the world, um, Wycliffe and SIL created other organizations that helped develop new organizations that were led by nationals so that the work could be carried out. In other cases, like it was with the Mexico branch, the strategy was to move the infrastructure to uh, near the border so they could still access Mexico but not have to deal with all the worries of government contracts and visas and all that stuff. So that, in a way, set up the stage for what's going on today even within our organization. Now, in the 90s, a lot of those, a lot of those civil wars and revolutions were ended. In Guatemala and El Salvador, the peace accords were signed in 96 and 97. In other countries, with the exception of Colombia, um, there was a process to a democratic government, and now nearly every country in Latin America has some form of democracy that is taking place. Um, 
but there also there were other things that happened in, in the 90s and early in the 21st century uh, that um, gave uh, started some of the things that are going on. I'm going to share with you in a little bit. But uh, neoliberalism, if you're familiar with that particular trend of economics, which was basically sponsored by a lot of the people who were um, who went and, and did their college studies in the U.S. and Europe in the 80s and 90s, and then they went back to their own countries and now are part of the government. But basically, it, um, it liberated trade. It believes in free trade between countries and also um, tying economic prosperity to democracy. It also meant that in a lot of our countries where there were monopolies, um, telecommunications and utilities, transportation were owned by the government, those were privatized. And that had some disastrous effects in some countries. In other countries like Chile, it actually had quite a, a good effect. And, and that's, not, that's not over, it's still happening, but it's also marked a lot of, of the debates and a lot of the conflicts that are happening even today in, in most of the countries in Central and South America. As you have seen in the news too, uh, in the last five years, there's been a significant turn to the left in terms of our political orientation, and not extreme left, no, not socialism, but countries like Argentina, Chile, Brazil, and, well, I shouldn't say Venezuela, because that's, that's a whole different thing. <laughs> uh, and most of Central American countries have governments that are center left. And that is also a reaction to some of the things that happened in the 90s and happened in the 80s. And a lot of it is a, re a response to what's, what's perceived as American interference and American influence in our governments and in our politics. So as we started the 21st century, not only did we see these things happening uh, that brought more stability to Latin America, but we also saw the tremendous growth in the church. And we started to see the evangelical church becoming a stakeholder and a, and a voice in the, in the social dialogue in countries like Guatemala and Brazil that have a, a large population of evangelicals. The still, um, the last 20 years have seen an increased uh, in violence, not civil war type of violence, but violence related mostly to drug trafficking. And that has produced things like gangs um, that are becoming organized, like in El Salvador and Guatemala. And they're coordinating their efforts with organized crime throughout the, the region and with street gangs in LA and, and other places like that in the US. And that has plagued countries like Mexico and, and Guatemala and Brazil and other, and other countries like that. So that's, that's just a little bit of kind of the broad sweep, you know, of, of the context. And I'm just so glad that you said what you said, Bob, you know, understand the times. Um, there is a, perhaps a, a sense that we in Wycliffe, we didn't have to worry about those things, that we, our job was to relate to the church. But as we started in the late 90s to, to increase our, our relationships, our partnership with local churches, um, it became very clear that we had to understand the context and we had to, we had to specifically understand the feelings that people had towards that large or American organization as they perceive it as Wycliffe and others, and how that was going to impact our relationships if we really wanted to see the Latin American church engaged in Bible translation. And so, some of the things that I see from my personal observation from our work in Wycliffe, and you know, you might have another Latin American standing here who will tell you something different. So, this is, this is my experience. I'm not a missiologist. I wish I could be. Um, that's not God's purpose for me at this time. <laughs> and so, thank you, Bob. That was great. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. So, understanding this context and understanding these times, the church in Latin, the evangelical church in Latin America still considers the Bible as the most important element in how they do things, when they do it, and where they do it. Bible-centric. Let me tell you a story. Uh, I, as, as Larry was sharing, I participate in Interdeb Partnership Associates, and we do some training in, print, in partnership principles. So I had all my charts ready and all this, these great models that I was going to teach at a, a, seminary, a seminar in, in Rosario, in Argentina. 
And the particular, the particular topic was conflict resolution. So I get on the board and I make this chart, you know, on the curve of conflict and all these steps and all that stuff. And when I'm halfway through it, one of the local pastors raises his hand, you know, an old, an old man who had a, a lot of respect. He was the most senior in the members, most senior pastor in, in the group. And he says, um, I just would like to know where did you find these things in the Bible? <laughs> and so, you know, I, deep in my heart, I, I know that these are biblical principles. And they were developed with that in mind. But I didn't have an answer for him at, at the time. And he said, well, just, just finish what you need to say. But, you know, I, we're just very concerned that all these uh, business models are being shoved down our throats and we're not really looking at God's word for answers and that's where we should be looking and so we looked at <laughs> we, we do an evaluation you know we looked at all our materials and we just revamped the whole thing and I actually spent quite a bit of time researching in the scripture all the stuff that that we had in that in that curve and that model conflict resolution and in fact it is I mean it was it wasn't hard to do but I the next time when I presented I had all these verses and I divided them into groups <laughs> And then, you know, it, it's almost like it, it all turned into a Bible study, and it was great. It was terrific, and it was more accepted. You know, it, and so I learned my lesson, you know, uh, that whenever I'm going to teach something, that's where I need to start, no matter what it is. And Chris, you talked about, you know, the separation. We can't separate. We're six days, we're secular, and one day we're evangelical or Christian, whatever you want to call yourself, followers of the way or something. And, and, and you don't have that separation We're in, in the churches and the people that we work with. The Bible is central. It's important. It, it has to inform our strategy. It has to inform the materials that we make, the presentations, the conferences. Ha they have to go back to what does God's word say. And, you know, at first you say, wow, you know, that's, how do we do that? But think about it. What are we asking them to get involved with us in? Bible translation. You know, what better context to explain that as we go to other places and we want to take the gospel, because the missions movement in Latin America is growing fast and it's taking the gospel to every corner of the earth. You know, that gives us just all the authority to say you cannot do this effectively if you don't have God's word in the language of the people that you are going to minister to. And it's, oh, oh yeah, well that makes sense. <laughs> you know, I don't need to explain, I don't need to justify, I don't need to uh, come up with these great ideas because they already believe it. So anyway, that's one thing that we need to remember. The church is diverse. I was um, invited in El Salvador, I was invited to, um, to a radio program and they wanted me to share about Bible translation. And you know, I've been in many churches in El Salvador. I have a lot of friends there. Great country. God is doing amazing things there. Such a small country. And so we're led to this, to this church. You know, we, it's in the, in the really scary part of town. And we're you know, going through this alley like this and like that. And then, you know, adobe walls and all that. And then the gates open. It has this beautiful church center. And they had a studio. State-of-the-art TV and radio studio. And they had four radio stations and two television stations. They broadcast, broadcast to the entire continent of, of Latin America and to the world through the internet. So I'm thinking, this is really interesting. And I, we do the interview, it was, it was great. Um, and then one of the, what I thought, I, I thought it was a pastor. He came up and you know, greeted us, gave us some coffee and all that stuff. And we started talking. And I asked him if he was the, the pastor of this church. He says, oh, no, 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 I'm one of 70. I said, well, how big is the church? He says, we don't really know. But last time we counted, it was 200,000 members. I said, well, how do you meet? And this place was gigantic. He says, oh, this place can't hold us. There's too many people. So we meet throughout the entire country. We actually have a congregation in three countries. I'm thinking, wow, you know, because most of the churches that I had been to, they, you know, 1,000 members, uh, 200 members. And, and here was a church that was, in, in a sense, it was totally underground. But it wasn't. It, when I, as I started asking and learning about it, this church has had quite an impact in working with the poor, the poorest of the poor, with gangs, 
uh, gang members and drug addicts and, and all that stuff, places where none of us can even get in. And there they are. The church is diverse. It's poor, but it's also rich. Come from all sorts of ethnic backgrounds. It's indigenous, and it comes from what we call mestizos, the mix of Europeans and, and, and indigenous people. It's mostly Pentecostal, but there are also a lot of good Baptist churches and other what we would consider more conservative or mainline denominations. I, just, I was just in, in a retreat last week with some of the leaders at Wycliffe and SIL, and one of our leaders shared that, um, you know, pray for her. Her church is going through a major split, and it turns out it's a church, um, should I say names? I, should, I shouldn't say names. But anyway, uh, traditional and denomination, and there, the main denomination is, has approved the uh, ordination of homosexuals and other things that are happening in there. So all these churches in this part of the country split from the main church in, <laughs> I don't want to get too specific, <laughs> in, in their country, and they now affiliated with the bishop, with a bishop in Chile. And I know that's happened too with churches in the U.S. and Nigeria. And so this is, this is the reality of, of what's happening around the world, and specifically in Latin America, as as Latin Americans perceive that the church in North America and Europe are walking away from their traditional roots and from, from the scripture, then they are becoming the centers of Christianity around the world, Latin America and Africa and Asia. The first time that I was asked to preach in Costa Rica, this, I had been there two weeks, pre preaching, I mean, you can ask me to do anything else but preaching, sorry, I mean... <laughs> It took a lot for me to wear a tie. And I'm just doing this because I have so much respect for Chris and I wanted to look nice. So I didn't want to, you know, anyway. I wanted you to look good because I look good, right? And so anyway, so I go to this church. I had to wear a tie. It's a little church in a, in a what do you call it in, in English? Uh, a poor neighborhood. I, let's just put it that way. It would, in fact, the taxi driver who took me there said, I'm going to pick you up at 9. Do not get out of the church until I show up. So it's that kind of town. And so I had my, my slides, and I had all this stuff ready. We're going to share about missions, you know, the, the percentage of evangelicals and the unreached and all that. I got all this stuff. And I get to this little church. There's about 80 people. And actually, the church is about the size of the stage and about as wide. And the pastor is in the front, and she's, preach, she's praying before I get there. And the whole church is on their feet, and they're jumping up and down as she prays. And she is just, you know, praying as loud as she can to the Lord. Some people are speaking in tongues. Some are singing. You know, there's, then there's worship and, and dancing. And I'm going, oh, man, what am I going to do? You know, so I get up to the, to the podium. I get my projector ready and all that stuff, and I start sharing. And it was quiet. And you should have seen their faces. You know, those like in, in TV when... When somebody tells a bad joke and all you hear is crickets in the background, that's how I felt. And they're looking at me. They're looking at me like, what is he doing? When is he going to start really preaching? You know, <laughs> with fire. <laughs> well, never, they never got it. So, you know, and I apologized. Um, then later, they were very gracious. And the pastor said, you know, we really needed that. You know, we, we can't just do all, everything based on emotions and, and, and feeling great. We really needed to know this, to fill our heads also with information. So, but it, that, gave me a, that gave me a window of, wow, you know, this is really different. It's not like my Baptist church back in Southern California. Thank you, Bob. And so, <laughs> and anyway, that, that was some of our experiences. But also, you know, when, when you, you're, you're leading in an organization like Wycliffe, where a large number of our people are Presbyterian or Baptists or others, and then you come to this context of hyper-Pentecostalism. You know, I go to church and um, start watching people, and, you know, they're falling to the ground. They, 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 some are healed. Others speak in tongues. Then they tell me these stories of things that have actually happened to them, you know, like in one church actually around about three blocks from our office in, in, in Costa Rica where... Um, they invited a preacher from Brazil, and there was this miracle campaign. And as he was praying and people were being healed, a, a, a rain of gold dust started falling on everyone and covering their, their skin. I'm thinking, oh, come on. 
you know? But everyone I asked who was in that church told me that's exactly what happened. And they were covered in gold dust. You know, and you hear, you hear people sharing about the dead being raised as a result of, 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 of prayer, of people being healed on the spot, and things like that. And that's really what's fueling the growth of the Pentecostal church in Latin America. Whether you believe it or not, or whether we agree with it or not, that is a reality that if we are meeting in a group like this with Latin American partners, that about two-thirds of them are Pentecostal. Or even if, if they are non-Pentecostal, their experience is still very much a Pentecostal experience. So whether you go to a Baptist church or you go to an independent church or a Bible church, you will probably feel that's more Pentecostal than you might be accustomed to. So how does that impact the, the type of relationships and partnerships that we have and how we as Wycliffe, in this case, can be truly effective in, in uh, enabling or helping this, these churches to be engaged. Um, as you can see, uh, a lot of is, is, is based on experience and not so much on theology. And that's good, but it's also a problem, as you, you, you will see. In terms of its mission, mission in, in, in Latin America, and again, I'm generalizing, you know, mission is church-centered. It's not done by agencies. Mission is the, the job of the church. And that is such an important thing I cannot emphasize anymore than I have because this is where a lot of organizations, including our own, have failed as they partner with Latin Americans. We, we, we did fail, and then we recovered from the failure. We learned our lesson. When I was um, regional director for Central America, we were working with a, a, a young woman from Guatemala, my own country. That's where I was born. And she wrote to me. She's a systems engineer. She designs... Um, circuits and I don't know what else for cell towers and cell, I mean, she's, she's pretty smart. So she wrote to us and asked if she could become a Bible translator. So our first, ten, our first reaction to that is, well, let's recruit her, right? And make sure that she gets the help she needs to get to do PD and all that stuff. So that's the way it was going. And then she, she wanted to do some studies and we were looking for money in the U.S. to sponsor her. So I got a big red flag from some of our partners in Central America. You know, it's just not the way to go. So I, we actually went to her church and started talking to them, and they said, you know, we don't support missionaries. And I said, why don't you support missionaries? And said, well, because all missionaries do is travel and use the church's resources, and the church never gets anything back. So we don't support missionaries, and especially to Wycliffe, because we know that you guys work with Catholics. So, you know, at that point, we could have said, well, forget this church. They don't want to support this young woman, so let's just figure out how to get her to the field. Um, and I, I wish I could say I was really wise and smart, but it, I wasn't. It was the people that I have associated with that are smart and wise. And they said, invest the time in getting to know her church and getting to understand the whole context and then helping them develop that vision. But, you know, there's, that's, that, that would take two or three years, and it did. I don't want to bore you with all the details of what happened in those two or three years, but at her uh, send-off, farewell service, where she was dedicated to the Lord, and we signed an agreement between Wycliffe and this church, um, the, the elder pastor, after it was all done, he put his arm around me. And I'll never forget this. With tears in his eyes, he said, thank you for respecting us as a church and giving us the time to understand for ourselves what God was calling us to do. Just like that. Thank you for respecting our own ignorance and our own resistance to God's will. And now that church has not only, has not only sent her, but has sent others. They're supporting missionaries throughout Guatemala and in other, in other places. And they are training their young people from the, the time they're in preschool and Sunday school. They're, they're being told about missions and about Bible translation. And they have great respect for Wycliffe and for other missions that are impacting the world with God's word. Amen. So we learned <laughs> from a little church in Guatemala, about 200 members, uh, what, what this means. But you'll see this throughout all of our uh, the, the mission movements around Latin America. Mission work is community oriented. 
and what I mean by that is um, the whole process is community oriented from the time you recruit someone to the, to the time where you were where that person is working on a field assignment and so to give you an example, one of our partners in Costa Rica, Fedomec, um, they have a department and a, a full-time person and several volunteers that their only job is to visit the families of the missionaries around the field. They visit the parents, they take them to the doctor. You see, because in our, in our culture, in that culture in particular, it's the, the, the job of the children to take care of the parents when they're old. Not the state, not any system is the children and so when the children are in the on the other side of the world serving the Lord you know the organization is taking making a, made a commitment to say we are going to fulfill the, that role to the best of our ability and partner with their local church but in some cases these people these parents these families are not believers they're not evangelical they're not Christians and so this is how we minister to them and many of them have come to the Lord because of the ministry of this department. I remember my, when I was, uh, I did a two-year stint with Fedomek working in their office. So I was observing all the different things, all the processes they have and all. And I went to, to an interview they had for, for one of the candidates who was going to, I think, the Middle East. And they do an interview right at the beginning, uh, right at the end of the process. But what was different about it is that the parents, and I mean, his parents and his siblings were in the room with him. So the interview was for the whole family, not just for the person. And in that interview, they were telling the family some of the things they had seen in this person, uh, the good things that they had observed, and some of the other things that they had observed that were not so positive, but that, that he was working on. It was just fascinating to hear the whole family was in on it. And then the director of Fedomek asked him the question. They said, you know, what would you do if he gets killed when he's overseas and we can't bring his body back or if he's kidnapped? And that's a real question. We don't give them a document so they can sign it. I mean, they do that, but, but it's a one-on-one -on -one relationship. Understandably, that's easier to do in a, in a small country, but even in, in, in big countries, you see that um, taking place. So the expectation also is that missionaries will work, go and work in teams teams of several families and not in individually as a couple or as a, as a person. The, mission, the work of missions is collaborative. That's a given. There are no silos. There shouldn't be anyway. anyway. Uh, Larry shared a, a little bit about uh, my service in Comivam. Comivam is established as a network. And here's another term for you that you might not have heard. Do you know what Iberia America is? I didn't invent it. <laughs> Do you know what Ibero-America is? Ibero-America is, is um, a term used mostly in, in diplomacy, diplomacy and, and, and in business to reflect the her common heritage shared by countries in the Iberic Peninsula, it's Portugal and Spain, and the Western Hemisphere, basically the whole hemisphere. The Hispanic and Portuguese her in, um, heritage shared by those countries. Um, and yes, including the United States. <laughs> no reaction. <laughs> for, and for that, you have to study some of the history of the southwestern United States. But anyway, and so this, this mission cooperation of Ibero-American, um, it's called Ibero-American Missionary Co Cooperation. That's what COMIVAM stands for. Uh, established in 1987 as a network of organizations that are mission-minded and churches and training centers for missions. And today, um, about 10,000 missionaries have come out of that, the work of that network. They don't send people, but they network those who do. And um, that's, that's a pretty good model. A again, it doesn't include all of the mission work that's being done out of Latin America. But it does reflect a lot of the things that I just shared with you. Missions that is church-centered, mission that is community-oriented, and mission that is collaborative. And the model of cooperation, as we see it in Comivam, is not an option that God gives us to, to have a better strategy, to be more effective. But it is the model that God, throughout His Word, gives us in terms of how we are to accomplish the work of the Great Commission together as a body 
reflecting an answer to the prayer of Jesus in John 17. So this is a little bit of context in the history and of the church and some of the things going on in Latin America. Then um, give you a kind of an overview of what the church is like, the evangelical church, and then what the mission out of Latin America is kind of like. Some of our challenges and difficulties, um, I call it the financial crunch, and that just means a real lack of resources and a perceived lack of resources. So, you know, we are still very much a, a, a continent in development, but um, there's a lot of wealth it's just not being used for uh, reaching the unreached. Um, and that's one of our concerns um, as we relate to the churches, uh, where, where are the priorities and where is the vision? And that's where the finances are. In our experience, it's the smaller churches, you know, averaging two to 300 members that are really supporting um, the, the work of missions. Just recently in January, we had a, a meeting of our, our senior leadership team in, in our global leadership team in, in Costa Rica. Uh, and I, at the end of the meeting, we went to different churches to preach. Um, and they were all country churches. So I was surprised because there, the majority of churches in, in Costa Rica are in, in, in the urban area, but they just all went to the, to the country churches. And I asked the director, Fathomek, and he says, those are the churches that are actually supporting our work, not the urban churches. They have too much going on. So it was these little tiny um, country churches that are supporting the majority of work. And that's, I have seen that in other places in Latin America. And there's also perceived, I think, perceived lack of resources. You know, we're poor, we need help, and um, you guys have all the money. You know, and I can say that, right? Because I'm from there, sort of. <laughs> but that's, that's, that's something that... Maybe I wasn't supposed to say that. <laughs> there's a perceived sense that... that um, we don't have what it takes. And sometimes it's been imbued into people, you know. And I have heard actually some of our colleagues, I haven't heard in a long time, but a few of our colleagues saying Latin Americans cannot do Bible translation. They don't have what it takes. And this message that had been sent, I, 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 sp I was speaking about this topic with the president of Comibam, and he says, because, you know, I've heard stories, and he says, well, you know, when I was young, in, in my church in Guatemala City, I wanted to be a missionary. I wanted us to have a mission, a mission vision, but the guy who founded our church, who was a missionary from the U.S., he told us, you cannot do missions. You worry about your own country, let us worry about the world. There's too many needs here for you to start thinking about going somewhere else. And so, there's that reality. A lot of, a lot of, a lot of leaders in the church still believe that. A friend of mine was talking to his, uh, his pastor in Chile, and he said, you know, talking about becoming a missional church, and he says, we are a missional church. We've been receiving missionaries for 100 years. <laughs> so just an understanding of what that, that means and, and, and getting over that barrier of thinking that we don't have the resources, we don't have what it takes, we don't have the ability. Um, one of our, our challenges as we partner is improvisation. You know, people tend to kind of do things at the last minute and, and not think through the whole, uh, the whole process. And, and, and in our experience, we have been successful at, at helping some of our partners um, work through that. But it's still very much a reality. And whether or not we like it or we agree with it, that is, that is what we are faced with as we work in Latin America. Um, Every day, in, in many countries, in Mexico and Central America mostly, and others, every day there are, especially at this time of year, anywhere between 20 to 30 short-term teams coming from the U.S., getting off planes and going to do projects throughout our countries, working in, in North Mexico and Central America, bringing the gospel to Latin America. I have sat in, on the plane with people who say, well, I'm going to bring the gospel to Guatemala. I'm going to plant a church. And there's a church in every corner, you know. And so that, that influence is constant. It's, it's, in, it's pervasive. It's everywhere. And that also is a reality that brings a reaction on the part of, of Latin leaders. 
well, here comes another American or another European or another missionary to bring us a package deal that if we just do things this way and we just follow these steps, we'll be successful because it's been tried and true. Um, and so how do we, how do we, I don't want to say overcome that, but how do we learn to be better partners on the side of, of Latin America, learning to, to, to understand what's going on and the intentions of people coming, but also in the parts of missions and organizations from the U.S., understanding that this is, that Latin America is come of age, that the church has a voice and it needs to find its own identity so that we can partner better instead of just constantly being bombarded by all these um, things. <laughs> Um, but that is, there is very much a, um, a, a reality and a challenge for us as we work there. Um, the influence of, of especially the United States in Latin America uh, for good and for bad. And another challenge, and that's something that we are working with our partners in, uh, is the realities of field missionaries from Latin America. And our, our I don't, how do you say, how do you, what do you call something that only happens every 10 years? Anyway, our, our Comey Bomb Congress in 2006, uh, one of the things that was, that was done was a study of the reality of missionaries from Latin America that are serving on the field. And the picture that came out um, was, while it was very, very encouraging on, in some aspects and very exciting, it also revealed some things, some lacks in, that, that are of concern to us and to those who are sending those people, the churches and the, and the missionary organizations, especially in the area of member care and other issues that have to do with the well-being of the missionary, as well as training and other things. So as we have been working with Comibam and identifying these issues, then that's where we can partner with them. But it's very much going to require not only a change in structures, but a change in mentality of the role of, of, a, of a field worker and the uh, the idea of sacrifice and dying to self. Um, so those are some of the challenges. For us in Wycliffe particularly, and I can only speak for Wycliffe because that's where I serve, uh, we need to understand the history of North and South relationships and, um, and all its glory, all the problems and all the successes that it has. We have learned that we, ha we must come with an attitude of service and humility and partnering working together and not with the idea that we've solved all the problems and that therefore we must now impart our great wisdom and knowledge to these people so that they can also be effective. As a friend of ours told uh, one of our, uh, a group of, of, of leaders from SIL in, in Wycliffe, he said, it's taken you 70 years to figure things out and we've been at it for five years, so just give us some time, we'll get there. Um, but we must, we have come with that, we, we're trying to come with that attitude of service and partnering humility. And one of those, one of, one of the implications for us in Wycliffe has meant that we agreed with our, with Comey Bam leadership and other partners not to create Wycliffe infrastructure, or Wycliffe structures in Latin America. That's why we don't have a Wycliffe Argentina and a Wycliffe Colombia and others. Because we realize that because of all, all the things and other things that I've shared with you, that would pretty much be seen as colonialism. Now, uh, we, we were asked to partner with the ch local churches and local mission movements to develop Bible translation structures that could challenge the church, that could help workers get to the field, but that they would be developed from the country, being financed by resources from the country, and being led by people from the country. And then we would partner with them, and that is what has happened. Some of some people, some of our people were very skeptical of this. Um, six years ago, seven, well, it's 2000, no, actually nine years ago, um, there were a handful of people in the churches in, in Latin America, in the countries that were actually aware of and promoting Bible translation. Now there's over 400 people, and there are over 20 organizations and denominations and churches that are partnering with us, and they're put, placing their people on the field doing Bible translation. Some are working with us, others are working in other organizations. But um, in, in such a short time, by following this model, God has just tremendously blessed us and seen um, a harvest that we did not imagine. We honestly didn't think that this was gonna um, happen, but it still mean, 
there's a lot of work to do in helping build the capacity to sustain these kinds of things. Um, another thing that we have learned is low-tech, high relationship, says he as he stands in front of his computer. Um, can I tell, share one more story? I'm all, almost running out of time. Uh, this, this is as I, I was preaching, and by then, you know, it's been three or four years, so I'm more comfortable preaching. And so I'm in this little church in, well, in the country, and I had to, to give a message. And I had my PowerPoint, you know, my, my digital projector, very nice, and I had my microphone, and I had all these things that I had all set up, you know, and they're like, wow, that looks really cool. The moment I grab that mic, power goes out. Completely, it's pitch black, and I'm going, great, here goes all my technology, right? And so, the, it's a small church, so I can, I can talk loud, I usually do, and then I can, you know, share the message. Well, as I start sharing, it begins to rain. But you have to understand, this is a tin roof, so I can't even hear myself. So, you know, what would you do if, if this happened in the U.S.? I don't know. I mean, it's never happened. So what they did is they all got off their, their, their chairs, and they all sat around where I was. They sat on the floor, all ages, all, you know, everyone sat around. And they lit some candles, and then I just shared with them like that. And it was so intimate, and it was so great. And as I finished, power came back on, lights and everything. <laughs> so ever since then, you know, I hardly ever use PowerPoint. I once in a while use my computer. Um, I won't tell you why I'm using the computer because it'll show. You. <laughs> well, I printed out my my outline and I left it at home. So, <laughs> uh, the nice thing about living between two cultures is that I can when I can say we and talking about Americans, and I can say we when I'm talking about Latin Americans. I can say we when I talk about Comey bomb, and then we when I'm talking about Wycliffe. So, if I confused you, that's why. <laughs> um, we must understand also. Um, the future and potential Bible translation movement that is already developing. Uh, and this movement really is going to run, and it is running on relationships instead of structures and policies and strategies. These will be part of the equation, but they will run on relationships. They do. And that's, that's really a factor that we cannot forget. Um, it was very interesting to me that um, when I started working in Central America that people said, well, we know Wycliffe, but we don't know you. Does that ring a bell with you? So it was like, yeah, it's a great organization, but that's not going to open the door. It might open the first door, but if you really want to get in, we need to get to know you. And so for us, it's meant that we need to think long term in terms of, of people who are involved in leadership because it takes time to build those trust relationships. And once they're built, a lot of things happen. But if we change leaders every two or three years, then that's gonna, that, that, that becomes a problem for us. We must understand the paradox that is Latin America and we have to be willing to accept and work through the contradictions. Classic, classic example. We go visit a church in the major capital of South America and as we leave the church just to the right, right next to the church is this little shop and they sell video games and movies. They're all pirated, right? They're all copied which is not very unusual in a country like this. It actually, this one country is known for that. But what's unusual is that the store is owned by the pastor and his sons. <laughs> so that's the contradiction, the paradox that is Latin America. And we must learn to not judge, but to, um, to get to know and understand, and then being able to speak prophetically into people's lives based on those relationships. I think one aspect that I haven't even started to talk about, uh, it's too, too big and too complicated, but we need to understand this also in, in light of the phenomenon of, of immigration and the realities of the church in exile um, of the Latin American church, particularly in the United States. You know, aside from um, our political tendencies, our political grid, or personal opinion about illegal immigration, just understand the realities and what that means for the church back home, so to speak, and the church in exile, and not only in the United States, but in, in Europe, in, in Asia, Australia, and places like that. I was surprised to find out that Fedemek got an invitation to minister to a group of churches in Tokyo, Latin churches. 
I didn't know there were Latin American immigrants in, in Japan, but apparently there are. And they're Christians and they're sharing the gospel with the Japanese. Or um, gotten requests, some of our partners have gotten requests to send pastors to pastor churches in Germany. Not Latin churches, German churches. So, you know, understanding that, that phenomenon and how God is taking not just Latin Americans, but Latin American Christians and sending them through throughout the earth, whether by immigration or by, by missional work. And what, what's one of the things that we found out at the Congress, Comey Bum Congress in 2006, that while we were counting people that went out from Latin America, about 10,000 under that movement, during the research they found what they call this parallel movement of people, probably in the, also in the thousands, who have become missionaries through, um, involuntarily, so to speak, because they have been exiled from their countries because of violence or economic hardship, and they get sent, saved, and then they start serving the Lord in those places. And they are missionaries, but they don't, they're not in the radar. So, so we need to, to start understanding that and being able to engage that kind of diaspora. So it's very clear to us that what's happening is just the beginning of something great and that we don't really know what God is up to, but if you, if you look at what's going on in Latin America, what has happened, um, sorry. you can edit that out of the video, right? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, that is very much God's time. And we must understand that time, and then we must ask ourselves as an organization, what is our role and how are, we going, how are we going to help our Latin American brothers and sisters become more effective in, in impacting the world with, the, with, with God's scripture? And understanding that um, there's a role to play as an organization that's mostly North American, but it's an international organization. That God has given us a special privilege of being there in Latin America at this time, being able to develop those trust relationships, and being able to partner to see Latin Americans impacting people groups around the world with the scripture. But we must, we must let them lead. We must let them lead and truly serve them. Should we pray? Lord Jesus, we thank you for the enormous privilege of just getting a glimpse of what's going on. And, and throughout this day, we're going to hear about what you're doing in, in the rest of the world. Lord, it's obvious that there's a great movement of your people, of your church, that you have, uh, you have something in store that we can't even imagine, Lord. Lord, as we have shared and, and learned a little bit about Latin America, we pray for our brothers and sisters who are there, who are ministering, who are in those neighborhoods, who are in those mission agencies and those churches, that, Lord, you will guide them, that you will give them the resources they need to accomplish the task and I pray for us, Lord, that we might learn from them. And as we do, that you will transform us and truly help us to be part of the global body of Christ with the global south, with the global north. Lord, that we may take your word and transform words, transform worlds, transform lives, transform communities around the world by the power of your spirit. And in the name of Jesus, we pray.